This is my favorite video that I've done for People Make Games. This video is gonna teach you about Jubentia, a brand new type of gaming coming out of China that in the last few years has taken an entire generation by storm. Translated as script murder, it shares some DNA with murder mystery dinner parties, but don't let that put you off. It's like pointing out that Hidetaka Miyazaki shares some DNA with a crab. It's true, but unhelpful. In this video, I'm gonna explain where Jubenja came from, how you play, why China's Gen Z got completely hooked on it before flying out to Singapore, where people are working the hardest to translate these games into English, to conduct interviews with shop owners, game masters, and super fans. And finally, following a bit of luck and a lot of effort, I'm gonna talk you through my experience actually playing one of these games in the English language. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. First, let's talk about what these games actually are. So like murder mystery dinner parties, Jubentia do see a bunch of people sat around role-playing as characters who are trying to solve a murder when one of them is usually the killer trying to escape the very investigation that they're participating in. But in China, that basic foundation has today exploded outwards in a new frontier of game design that is pushing the envelope of deduction, of role-playing, of storytelling, and a lot of the demand for which is being led by young women. And this is not some niche thing. This is a sensation. According to one report referenced by the South China Morning Post, there were an estimated 30,000 Jubentia shops across China by 2021. To give you a point of comparison, according to an industry report, the number of escape rooms in the United States peaked in 2019 with around 2,350. It's not comparable at all. But even these statistics don't do the size of the scene justice because today there are also apps and boxed products that let you play Jubentia at home, as well as Jubentia cruises, Jubentia hotel experiences, even entire villages with hundreds of actors pottering around where you can experience Jubentia like a cross between game design and immersive theater. In fact, today, for many fans, Jubentia has evolved way beyond even being about a murder. Popular genres of Jubentia now include horror games, tear-jerking romances, sci-fi, fantasy, and mechanism Jubentia, which bring in elements of board games and game shows. It is wild to me that in the West, we simply haven't heard of what might be the most exciting and innovative thing happening in game design today. Because let me tell you, these games, they're just something else. So let's begin with the unexpected story of how Jubentia was born. Part of Jubentia's meteoric rise can actually be traced back to a French murder mystery board game called Death Wears White by excellent designer Guillaume Montiage, published around 2001. In this game, a whopping nine players spend about four to five hours painstakingly solving a murder in a hospital, going over all this evidence and everyone's alibis to try and work out which of you did it. Now, I've worked as a professional board game journalist for 12 years, and I've never heard of this game. So clearly, in the English language world, it didn't make much of an impact. But 12 years later, this game, this seed, gets translated into Mandarin, where it's a cult hit. In 2016, following on from such popular Chinese reality shows as Dinner Party Seduction, a show where celebrities play werewolf, Chinese production company Mango TV buys the rights to the Korean game show Crime Scene, restyling it in China as Who's the Murderer? A reality show that riffs on the format created by the board game Death Wears White. In the show, a cast of celebrities are assigned characters and proceed to spend a whole season, again, going over everyone's alibis and searching for evidence to try and work out who of them did it. And this show is a dynamite hit. Today, they're working on the ninth season. And this show starts off more Chinese game designers creating more games in this format. And eventually, the most popular way to experience it became Jubentia Shops, where today you and your friends show up at one of the country's tens of thousands of shops, and a game master runs one of the venue's dozens of boxed scripts for you. It's sort of like you're paying a Western game master to run one session of a tabletop role-playing game for you, except in Jubentia, the GM fades into the background pretty quick because they just want you to feel that you're living out glass onion. You vainglorious buffoon. Okay, that's the history. Let's get into how you play. 
So you and your friends enter a room, and the GM also comes in with the game materials. Some shops would also give you on-theme costumes to wear, or have the game take place in a set that's a fully immersive crime scene for you to explore. And the game starts by giving everyone what's called a script, but is more like a booklet explaining who your character is and what they know when the game begins. This is the big deviation from Western murder mystery games, which might give you like a postcard of information to read about your character and what they know. In Jubenture, strap in, sucker. You're reading for 15 minutes at minimum, but for the more hardcore games, you might all be reading different little booklets for over an hour. And you're doing all of this reading because it's prepping you for an epic experience. A simple Juventure might finish in three hours, but for players who get the bug, there are Juventure that lasts for six hours, seven hours, even multiple days. But this game is just a conversation, right? How do you sustain a conversation for seven hours? Well, first off, Different characters in the script all know different stuff, but also have different objectives, different secrets, different secret objectives. So Jubenture is mostly powered by a lot of super fun and very coy in-character sharing of details and asking of questions. Then, if you're on a set, you might search the room you're in, or for box games, the GM deals out evidence cards of things the characters find. This leads to a protracted, but totally delicious phase of the game where players slap down evidence they found at just the right moment to cause maximum discomfort for the player you just caught out telling a big fib. Then there might be a mini game that occurs in the story. There might be another round of scripts for you to read, another round of evidence cards, or sub-mysteries or ethical dilemmas the players have to agree on before they proceed. And since each of these phases last about 45 minutes, time flies by as you all peel back layer after layer of this mystery with players earning and spending trust with one another to further their own goals before, as a group, you vote on who you think did it. If you're right, the murder is caught, but if you're wrong, they win. And finally, the GM comes out and slowly reveals what actually happened in this thing you've been bickering about for hours, as if they were drizzling honey. You see that, Game Master? They're only here to keep the train on the rails. They set the moods, they answer questions, they watch the clock, but if the game's going smoothly, they basically disappear. Or here's another way to think about it. You know how when you do an escape room, you and your friends all show up and then face away from each other to solve like two dozen puzzles that are all on the walls? Jubenture is similar, but the puzzles are all contained in the other players sat opposite you. So rather than entering a room and then facing away from one another in the manner of anxious people riding an elevator, Jubenture is all about facing inwards and looking your friends in the eye and trying to figure out who's lying. It's all of you. You're all probably lying. But why are you lying? Well, you're probably going to lie about that too. One final interesting thing about the structure of Jubenture, almost all of them are designed for exactly six players, three men, and three women and we're going to talk more about the role of gender in this hobby later in this video. But also, in the Jubenture scene, people will show up with just one or two friends, or even alone, and then play these games with strangers. And a huge reason for Jubenture's popularity is that more than any kind of game that we have in the West, it is a perfect way to make friends and meet people. Because everybody's playing a character in a story, everyone gets to immediately act pretty familiar with one another. If we're playing a game together, I might not know who you are as a person, but if we're role-playing siblings, then we're immediately gonna act close and teasing and judgmental. And second, because Jubenture is all about secrets and who to trust and what you share with whom, the game almost immediately sees players pulling one another aside to share important information with. Think of it this way. Usually, when you're meeting new people, the most stressful thing is not knowing what you're gonna talk about. With Jubentia, you have no choice but to talk about this one specific exciting thing for hours and hours and hours. It would be weirder if you didn't, after the game, go and get tea or food or something. So yeah, today it is hard to overstate how beloved Jubentia is to a generation of Chinese gamers. An expression I heard twice when researching this story is that two generations ago, the Chinese hobby of choice was karaoke. Today, it's Jubentia. The sadly now finished Chinese culture substack Chaoyang Trap said that a line they often see in Chinese Tinder profiles is no hookups, yes Jubentia, and referenced a report that said Jubentia was the third biggest offline entertainment after movies and sports. 
In 2021, Chinese video game mega publisher Tencent got in on the action by writing and filming a special adventure playthrough with the voice actors of their flagship game, Honor of Kings. And last year, Estee Lauder was one of several luxury brands to launch a adventure themed product that combines skincare with a game. And like I teased earlier, all over the country there were these epic Jubentia installations. What you're looking at now is an advert for Qing Qianzhan Peace in Chang'an, the national winner at China's latest experiential game awards in the cultural category and it is a two-day, one-night Jubentia set during the Tang Dynasty that takes place in a whole-ass town with dozens of actors. It's like immersive theatre, where you're also the protagonists, but you don't have to learn any lines, because you just say whatever you want. But of course, People Make Games can only learn so much about Jubentia reading about it online. And so, thanks to the People Make Games patrons, I was able to hop on a plane to do some boots-on-the-ground reporting. We made it, we made it baby. Just two short eight hour flights and here I am in Singapore, a land where it's just hot as f Seriously, this humidity, I was not ready for it. I didn't, I got, don't have the clothes for it. Didn't Google the weather before I came here. That's okay, because what's hotter than the weather, it's games that I'm gonna look at. I came here because Singapore is a city with Jubentia shops that mostly cater to Chinese students, but also a lot of the people in this city speak English as a first language, so plenty of folk are doing the work of translating and marketing these games for a new English-speaking audience. And almost immediately, I found out that one of my assumptions about Jubentia was wrong. Researching this story, I thought most Jubentia fans loved the experience of unpicking a mystery, like a social puzzle. But what I found out is for the people who get hooked, the best part is the role playing and stepping into the shoes of someone totally unlike yourself. I mean, I think when we started out playing more beginner games as well, we were used to the very clear idea that the point is to go there, one of you is a murderer, you have to figure out who it was, right? But as we kind of explored the genre, we found more interesting things that games could do, right? So you go there not just wanting to have the intellectual exercise, but to enjoy the process of discovery both as yourself but as the character. You might realise that you did something terrible, without meaning to. You killed someone, but oh, they were actually your long lost sister or something something extremely melodramatic like that. Or if it's one of those cases where you know what you've done, but you don't know whether you actually succeeded in killing them, then for you, the process of finding out who the murderer is also matters at that pure, you know, am I going to get away with it? Or did I actually do it? Am I guilty or not? Like even the game, the win conditions change for you. 剧本杀就是让你体验到不同的角色嘛，那有些角色可能会特别让你就是共情，以及比如说他所经历的事情。对于情感本的话，我比较喜欢现代情感或者校园情感，因为年纪也刚好符合我现在，我就是会比较带入
每一个玩家六人剧本，每个玩家都会哭的一个剧本。呃，我的话，因为我在这里呢是主带情感剧本的，所以说我会相对来说更加去擅长带情感剧本。呃，因为我带情感本的时候，比如说，呃，去读一些台词，可以有一个很明显的情绪波动，然后能把玩家带入到里面。包括一些，比如说哭腔啊之类的，以及有的时候在一个大的悲伤的氛围里面，也会带动玩家去哭。For many of the people I was speaking to, cathartic group crying sort of felt like the gold standard of these games. But when I stopped over at Jubenja Company Criminal X, they were excited to show me just how diverse the scene is, including a game about amateur rappers where players literally have to write raps. And that game aside, I was desperate to play everything else he showed me. Okay, so this one, you know the tree, how you tell the age is. The, uh, through the rings of the tree. Yeah, the rings of the tree. Yeah, exactly. So, so it means the rings of the tree. Yeah, it's a classic. Some details, for example, in your story, person A is a chef, but in my story, he's a teacher. Uh. We won't find out without you know discussing it. So at some point, you people will notice. Okay, things doesn't match, and then slowly you piece things together and find out. Oh, this is called hello. It's really a good one. So basically, there are three couples within it. There, there's the parents, the kid who also grown up, and also their friends. It's a complex story actually. I can't、uh, spoil it too much, but、okay. each couple they sacrifice for each other. And you know, the moment that you find out the truth,、uh, I cry with my girlfriend. We play together. Also, there's a murder case, but <laughs> also there's a murder, but that's not that important. Yeah, it's not that important. Like, <laughs> like nobody really cares who's the murder is <laughs> at the end of the game. Wang also showed me a game about the Chinese process of matchmaking to find a spouse, which was literally aimed at players who were looking to find a spouse. So maybe it's time we talk about the role of gender in Jubenja, with most games being designed for exactly three male and three female players. The the thing about gender is interesting, right? Because obviously the the characters have、um, specified genders, and sometimes, especially for the emotional games, they will encourage you to play a character with a similar gender identity and so on. And there are also some cases which are quite progressive in that、um, you do have, say, like queer storylines or sexual minorities, and it's often it can be played quite sensitively and not in some sort of sensational way. And being able to kind of actually even do that in China's censorship environments, I think, is quite valuable. And to also encourage a sort of imaginative empathy, right? The player starts with a script, someone who hasn't thought very much about the experience of being a sexual minority, and then through the process of playing through the game and realizing the struggles that their character faces, you know, you could achieve something there. Actually, Jay would, however, stop before describing the scene as progressive. There's actually a lot of juvenile games as well. Juvenile in terms of the emotional maturity of how they treat the teens, right? And the industry itself as well. There's a lot of discussion about games which just use like sex and gore and violence for shock value. There was actually a spate of cases where the games just piled on lots of themes of like sexual assault, just like really twisted and like gleefully sordid themes just for the shock value. Do、so、there have, is a problem in this in the industry. Do they have trigger warnings or safety tools or anything like no, that? No, right. So that's the other thing as well. Precisely because. Half of it is a mystery. There are no content warnings. You can come. You can sometimes get quite unpleasant surprises. So there was one script I played where the character of Sensibi is just like a male character, and then halfway through you realise that actually, firstly they were they are female. They were female character in their past life or something complicated like that. And then like it's the middle of a rape scene, right, from a first person point of view. So like, I can imagine that's very upsetting if you have, especially if there is a trigger for you. Jay's warning would end up being quite prophetic for where this video goes next. Okay, so this was going to be the part of the video where we did a cool let's play of one of the few English language Jubenja in existence, GM'd by one of the Singaporean people who wrote it, and it was going to have these cool YouTube celebrities you've definitely heard of, and it was going to take place in this cool room that we rented. And instead, we chose not to do that. Because at the last minute, we found out that the content of the game we were about to play included not just murder, but also sexual assault, which could have put our guests or ourselves in a potentially complicated or uncomfortable situation, in which they were intentionally or not role-playing a game on the internet, in which they might hide or aid in hiding a sex crime. 
But we still have the room, we still have the game, and we still have the GM. So instead, we've just invited some friends of ours to come and play the game, and we're still going to explore it, we're still going to explore those themes, we're still going to embody those characters, we're just not going to do it in public on the internet forever. Now, in a moment, I am going to talk about what it was like to actually play a Jubentia, but... Wow! I was stunned to discover that not only the game we had scheduled to play, but the other boxed English Jubentia that I got sent home with also had a female playable character who'd been sexually assaulted in the script. And this is a big secret that comes out during the game! It's part of the plot that you are acting out and reacting to. And in some Jubentia plots, the character who sexually assaulted you might well be another of the players at the table. That was a shock to me. I'm sure it is to you too. But in China, Jubencha's closest relatives aren't just games, but the enormous industry of crime fiction, thrillers, and mystery novels, in which sexual assault is often part of the plot and a motivating factor for characters. But when I was talking about all of this to my friends who like crime fiction, their response was like, well, obviously the game should have that. Especially when the entire genre of Jubentia is so cavalier about using murder as a propulsive narrative device. And I do think it's interesting that in the West, many of us wouldn't blink at a game asking us to pretend to be someone who's committed a murder, but the idea of a game asking us to pretend to be someone who's committed a sexual assault is just beyond the pale. I think that speaks to many people's discomfort living in a patriarchal society that prefers not to think about a problem that largely affects women. A society that does produce games about PTSD, but PTSD that mostly affects men, if you think about how many games there are about the horror of war. The problematic element of Jubentia isn't the content at all. It's just the fact that Jubentia has, currently, no safety tools of any kind. That is quite the contrast with the tabletop RPG community in the West, which has, in the last 10 years or so, really embraced safety tools. And I think it's something that might have to change if we're going to start importing Jubentia in the West. So today, in the TTRPG space, which includes Dungeons and & Dragons and whatnot, before your campaign begins, players are encouraged to have a conversation about what content they do or don't want to see, and a lot of game masters will use something called an X card, which is a tool that players can touch that basically says, this scene stops because it sucks for me, and I don't have to explain why, because that would also suck for me. Now, when I talked about this with Jubentia fans in Singapore, the response that I heard was, ah, we don't need that because we can handle dark themes. That's not really what safety tools are for. Safety tools aren't there for the majority of players. They're there for the minority of players who've gone through something awful that the rest of the players don't know about. While everyone else is having fun acting out a scene, that player is having an awful time but can't say anything because unlike a book or a movie, the social contract that they have entered into means they can't leave without ruining this experience for everybody. Or on the subject of something like content warnings, let me speak from personal experience. I have traumas that I might find super cathartic to explore in a role-playing game, but with content warnings I can make sure I don't enter that specific experience with strangers or with a game that I've heard isn't that sensitive about the subject matter. Safety tools aren't there so coddled role-playing fans can no part of any discomfort. They're there so all of us can more easily engage with dark stuff. From America's hardcore haunted houses to the legendarily emotionally devastating games of the Nordic LARP community, safety tools enable role players to experiment with some of the darkest role play on the planet. Some of it that would literally be illegal otherwise. <sighs> anyway, rant over. Our experience of playing Jubentia without turning into a Let's Play was great. All five of us had a phenomenal time. I'm not surprised this hobby has spread like wildfire. I'd be playing Jubentia every week if I could, and it would be the best thing I did that week. This despite me looking so guilty in our game that I almost immediately knocked over a glass of water. Jesus. And then 10 minutes later, somehow managed to do it again. I don't know why it's lost back to Oh my <laughs> Holy <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Which is like slapstick levels of looking shifty. I wasn't the murderer. The cops still should have locked me away. I've seen this episode of Columbo. <laughs> Our story centered on chemistry students at a university trying to solve the murder of their own professor in their own laboratory. So the game started with us all giving our alibis in a very respectful and innocent sounding tone. Damien's my friend. Just too quiet. 
reserve people. Before our GM handed out the first batch of evidence cards, as we all had the opportunity to search the crime scene and one another's dorm rooms, which was like taking the candle that we'd lit in memory of our dead teacher and just pouring gasoline on it. Why you got a bag of aerosol cans, man? <laughs> <laughs> well, is, it, is it normal for a 39-year-old research assistant to be carrying a bag of aerosol cans on Reddit and also on your laptop having a folder containing various news articles featuring Chloe and research articles post published by Chloe? Well, you have news articles about me? What am I in news? You're on research papers. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I'm very good. <laughs> <laughs> and I just cannot describe to you how fun it was to slowly untie this incredibly complicated story through the medium of pointing out that your friend is lying over and over and over again and watching them squirm every single time as they try and figure out how much more of the truth they have to give you to make this excruciating attention go away. On your computer there was an e-receipt showing a post from a dark website for cyanide. It was you, you found that on my computer. You said that you spent so most of your time looking for clothes. I have, you, <laughs> yeah, I not looking at clothes like that were, and then you accidentally went to the poison. It's a cool new shop called cyanide. No, I didn't order, but I do, okay, listen, listen. As we entered the third hour of our inaugural adventure experience, I was blindsided by a handful of twists that, if I'd been more familiar with soap operas or crime fiction, I might have seen coming. But in the context of a social deduction game, just floored me. Turns out my character was an unreliable narrator and I didn't know it. Several characters weren't who I thought. There was love of all kinds shot through the mystery like marbling in steak. And can I ask you why in your room there was a shattered photo frame on the desk? Uh, that had a picture of you and Jermaine hugging. <laughs> <laughs> Is there maybe a connection between there those was a <laughs> By the time we finished, I was the only player who didn't identify the murderer correctly. And do you know why? It's because not me, but my character that I was role playing had reasons to trust him. And that had corrupted my own ability as a player to solve the puzzle. Terrific. Perfect ending. No notes. Flawless. And here's the thing, as we all left that game and immediately went to the pub to talk about what we'd just experienced, if I had the ability to sign up to another Jubancha game, I'd have done it immediately, but I'd want something that was longer now that I've got a taste for it, something more epic and convoluted, maybe trying one of the different genres of Jubancha, like a romance or a horror. I had my first hit and I was desperate for more, and I can't have any more, because this whole world of amazing games is currently not available outside of China. That's not an experience I'm very used to as a game journalist, I'll be honest. And I'm not very good at dealing with it. So now I'm going to do something that's only semi-professional. I'm going to try and use my platform to change things. So if you two would like to play these games, let's get the word out. Please, for yourself or just for me, share this video with a friend so more people can find out about these games so we can increase demand outside of China and get all of these new, brilliant, envelope-pushing game designers some recognition outside of their home country. Let's help this scene go global. Not least because Jubencha's future inside of China is looking just a touch less bright in 2023. The Chinese government has a long history of censoring everything from the internet to books to movies to bring it in line with the state's moral and cultural norms. And for a moment there, Jubencha was new enough that it had escaped the state's attention. That's less and less true with every passing year. In 2021, plainclothes police officers in Shanxi province went undercover in Jubencha shops and confiscated games that had, quote, bloody and gruesome elements. By 2022, local governments in Shanghai and Guangdong province began requiring Jubencha providers submit scripts for state approval, seeking to weed out scripts that might propagate sex, violence, or superstition. This slow backpedaling of violence in Jubencha mysteries can be seen very clearly in the original hit TV show, Who's the Murderer? Where subsequent seasons have dedicated more and more airtime to explaining that murder is bad, actually. And today features a judge explaining what the penalties would be for the crimes you see in the show. And this year in 2023, the National Ministry of Culture and Tourism announced further guidance on the regulation of the Jubencha industry. Where, according to reports about this announcement, content that eulogizes the Communist Party of China, promotes the core values of socialism, builds a strong sense of Chinese national community, and promotes the popularization of science and technology are among those encouraged by the ministry as per the document. 
which sure sounds like the Chinese government would like the jubenja industry to go the way of the Chinese movie industry, where at best movies are socially conservative and at worst they are queasily nationalistic. Now, I don't want to mischaracterize what's happening here because I certainly do not know what the ramifications of any of this government interest is going to be, and none of the people that I spoke to for this story brought this up as a pressing issue that I should know about as a journalist. But equally, the games that people chose to tell me about to sell me on the Jubensha experience, Chinese cops struggling with a miscarriage of justice, queer storylines, or frightening and bloody ghost stories, I personally can't see those stories getting marketed or even developed in a circumstance where every Jubensha game has to be rubber stamped by a Chinese state censor. And frankly, I find this new vein of game development so exciting, I hate to think of it being limited in its growth by any government. So I'm just sat here at my desk, hoping against hope that people like you will join me in doing what you can to help this scene go global, even if it's just telling more people about it. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. If you'd like to support deep dives into underreported areas of games, that's what we do, baby! And it's all funded by people on patreon.com slash peoplemakegames who pay us a little bit every month so we can do things like fly out to Singapore to conduct interviews and then pay translators and fixers so we know what anyone in those interviews is saying. So please consider going to patreon.com slash peoplemakegames to get exclusive content and also support the work we do. And hey, personally, just from me to all of our patrons watching this, thank you, because I can't tell you how exciting and fulfilling I found researching this story. Just very grateful that I get to do this job. Cheers.